Unfortunately, the president has no respect for the rule of law. Impeachment hardliner Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz says the Senate should convict the president, but first, they need to get the articles of impeachment. We'll talk about it with the veteran Democrat. Oh, it's disgusting. I mean, it's just poop water. Another sewage pipe break in Broward, this one in Victoria Park. It's the fourth time a sewage pipe has broken in Fort Lauderdale in three weeks. Pew. Conservative Christmas, the Trumps attend a Baptist church on Christmas Eve, skipping the liberal Episcopal church where they were married, all ahead of a rally in Miami with evangelical Christians. Why do they love Donald Trump? We'll take that to the round table. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney, Glenna is off today. We're going to begin with impeachment and the status of those two articles charging President Trump with first, abuse of power, second, obstruction of Congress. South Florida Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz voted for impeachment and also supports the delay in sending those articles over to the Senate where the trial will be held. We in, and we invited Republican Congressman Mario diaz Balart to join us for this discussion. Unfortunately, he was not available. So we got the Democratic point of view when we spoke by satellite late this week with Representative Wasserman Schultz. And joining us now from Hanover, New Hampshire, is Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Congresswoman, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, happy holidays to you and your family. Thank you. Let's begin. Happy holidays to everyone, you as well, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's begin, obviously, with impeachment. Uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has not sent the articles of impeachment over to the Senate. Uh, Senator Mitch McConnell has not released the ground rules for the trial. We've got an impasse. How is this impasse going to be broken? Well, it can be broken very easily by Senator McConnell making sure that the trial that they are swearing an oath to ensure is fair and impartial is actually fair and impartial. He has already said publicly that he's not an impartial juror basically acknowledging that he'll violate the oath he's required to take when the trial commences, and that's unacceptable. I mean, we impeached uh, President Trump in the House of Representatives because of his gross abuse of power, because he violated federal appropriations law, pressuring a president of a foreign country, President Zelensky of Ukraine, to release, uh, to, to, uh, to, in order to get the hundreds of millions of dollars that they vitally needed to keep Russia at bay, um, and pushed him to investigate his political opponent, Joe Biden, and interfere with the 2020 presidential election. That's absolutely outrageous and unacceptable. And Mitch McConnell should want to get to the bottom of it. They need to call witnesses. They need to produce ev documents that have never been reviewed because President Trump has forbidden them for, to, from right. being released to the Congress, which is also unprecedented. Yeah. Well, we know that when the House Intelligence, House Judiciary Committees, held their hearings that he invoked executive privilege, would not let uh, Mick Mulvaney or any other person within the executive branch come and testify. So do you realistically believe that he's going to change his mind and say, sure, go over to the Senate and testify? This was uh, certainly not uh, in the bounds of executive privilege. This is un an unprecedented gross abuse of power. We have never before, during an impeachment process in American history, had a president patently refuse to allow witnesses to testify, to produce evidence requested by the Congress. This is a role that is exclusive in the Constitution to the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate. And for the president to withhold evidence and, and witnesses really is the um, conduct of a guilty person. When you're innocent, you want to produce as much as you can to demonstrate that innocence. The, the act of a guilty person is, is cover up. And now, Michael, we even, after we impeached President Trump just, uh, just before the holiday, um, we see that with a release of emails that 90 minutes after he hung up with President Zelensky, and had pressured him to launch an investigation against his 20, a 2020 political rival, he ordered the hundreds of millions of dollars of federal appropriations withheld. And we need to get to the bottom of that. Michael Duffy should, should be one of yeah. the witnesses and along with other witnesses who were part of that fact pattern. Well, the, the fact, the incident you just cited, which has come out in the last week or so, 
it falls under the general heading of abuse of power, but the polls that I think that we have all seen say that roughly half of all Americans, although many believe that the president showed bad judgment by asking President Zelensky for a favor, uh, nevertheless, they don't think he should be thrown out of office. So how can the Congress go ahead and remove a, a president from office who at least half of all Americans at this point don't think should be removed? Yeah, the other half, that half not thinking he should be removed means the other half thinks he should. And that's where our responsibility as, uh, as members of Congress in the House, with our responsibility over the impeachment process and the Senate with a responsibility to Im be impartial jurors over the uh, trial that, and determine whether he should be convicted and removed, uh, emphasis on impartiality kicks in. It's the Senate's responsibility to review evidence, to hear from witnesses, and reach their own conclusion. We, we are sent to the Capitol by our constituents to make decisions on their behalf. And at the end of the day, that's our responsibility. And when you have a president like Donald Trump, who has not only abused his power, but violated federal appropriations law, jeopardized our national security, because certainly uh, take, withholding and keeping, jeopardizing Ukrainian security jeopardizes American security. You, you, you cannot withhold uh, out of, on a whim as, a, as the president, hundreds of millions of dollars of federal appropriations that were signed into law, passed by the Congress, because you want to pressure a, a, the head of another, of another country to do your political bidding. Yes. And that's what he tried to do, and that's why he's impeached. And we know, of course, from the president, time and again, he says this is a sham, a hoax, a witch hunt, and a illegal partisan attempted coup are the phrases, the phrase he used, when he wrote that six-page letter to Speaker Pelosi. Uh, Congresswoman, we know uh, that Speaker- Unfortunately, the president has no respect for the rule of law. Speaker Pelosi is going to soon name the floor managers. The House members are going to go over and prosecute. And so we can expect to see the names of the floor managers uh, soon, early January. When do you think we are going to know who's going to be on that team? Speaker in in due time, I mean, at this point, Speaker Pelosi is rightly withholding the articles of impeachment and naming impeachment managers because it is absolutely essential that we know what the Senate process is going to be, that we ha have Senator Schumer having requested witnesses to be called and documents to be produced. There has never been an impeachment trial in which witnesses have not been called. That would be unprecedented. There were 41 witnesses in the impeachment trial of, uh, of Andrew Johnson, three witnesses called with, uh, with the impeachment of Bill Clinton. And so it's, it's essential that the Senate, in order to be able to impartially review evidence and hear from witnesses, actually have witnesses who testify. Right. And President Trump has been an absolute obstructionist in, in allowing that to happen, and it's unacceptable. Yeah. Representative Wasserman Schultz, as you well know, Chief Justice John Roberts is going to preside over the trial. Do you have confidence that Chief Justice Roberts is going to be able to fairly run this proceeding? Oh, I do. Yes. I mean, I, I think uh, Chief Justice Roberts has demonstrated that he has integrity and and believes in the oath that he swore to uphold the Constitution. And uh, you know, he's had decision handed down decisions that uh, that I have agreed with, some that I've disagreed with. And so, yes, I expect that that uh, that he'll run a trial fairly. Um, however, the rules of the trial of the trial are determined by Mitch McConnell and the Republican majority. And I think that he should listen to colleagues like Senator Lisa Murkowski and walk back his really inappropriate, unacceptable comments where he said he's not an impartial juror and he's coordinating with the, with the, with the, uh, the, the individual who right. the trial will be about is, and, and make sure that, that his, his oath is upheld. Um, well, at the end of the day, we have to get back to the work that the House has been doing at the same time because we walk and chew gum at the same time. We've sent hundreds of bills. There are 275 bipartisan bills sitting in the United States Senate now, including H.R. 8, which would 
allow, allow for there to be, require that there be universal background checks for, uh, to address gun violence, make sure that we can lower prescription, the cost of prescription drugs, make sure that our elections are fair and that we don't have to worry about interference in our elections. Uh, th those are all bills that the, presid that, that the pr president uh, you know, has, has not done anything to pressure Mitch McConnell to move. And Mitch McConnell has declared himself the grim reaper of legislation coming from the House. Um, I'm not sure why he's there. He's up for re-election. I, I think uh, Kentuckians should take notice of what, what he apparently is there for, and that's to be uh, Donald Trump's uh, do boy. We are going to take a very quick break, and we'll be back with more with Representative Debbie Westerman Schultz in just a minute. Welcome back. Today we are speaking with Congresswoman W. Wasserman Schultz, who is with her family in Hanover, New Hampshire, the home of Dartmouth College, a great school. Uh, Congresswoman, you mentioned Senator Lisa, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. She is the, the lone Democrat, I'm sorry, the lone Republican so far in the Senate, who has said she finds what Mitch McConnell has said and done somewhat disturbing procedurally. Now, there could be some others. I mean, Joe Manchin of uh, West Virginia, maybe Mitt Romney of Utah. I mean, do you think that there are going to be a few courageous Republicans who may say, uh, let's have a full-blown trial and could even vote to convict? Well, for the record, Joe Manchin is still a Democrat the last time I checked. But yes. um, I, I do expect In a red that... State. <laughs> I do expect... <laughs> right. I do expect that uh, that there are Republicans, and, and certainly hope there are, that will express privately, publicly, like Lisa Murkowski has done, that the trial that the, that the Senate conducts needs to be fair and impartial, that we need to make sure that we hear from witnesses, that we are able, that senators are able to review the evidence that President Trump has withheld um, in an unprecedented way. We've not ever had a president in an impeachment trial withhold witnesses, withhold, uh, withhold evidence, uh, documents that are vital to senators being able to make their decision. You know, we were able to call witnesses and we had courageous witnesses come before us in the House of Representatives in spite of President Trump's you know, prohibition. And that helped, that aided us in being able to put the pieces together of his abuse of power, his jeopardy, jeopardizing our national security, and you know, be able to say this is, this is unacceptable and, and vote to impeach him. Yeah. We, we must make sure that this trial proceeds in, uh, under the rule of law and the United States Constitution. Yeah. Congresswoman, a major factor, obviously, in the election next year, in every presidential election, is the economy and the stock market is just going bananas. It is ending this week and the year at a record high. The president just sent out a tweet today. It says, Trump's stock market rally is far outpacing past U.S. presidents at CNBC. With new trade deals and more, the best is yet to come. I mean, would you concede that the economy is really in very good shape? Thanks to the uh, long coattails of President Obama's economic policies, yes, the, pre the, uh, the economy is doing well. But what isn't doing well is that we have an explosive deficit that has been expanded by billions and billions of dollars by this president and the Republicans when they were in the majority. They have ta a tax package that they, uh, that they adopted unpaid for that you know, they said was going to pay for itself that every uh, reputable economic organization has said is not paying for itself. And so spending grossly ir in an irresponsible way is going to catch up with us eventually. And so, uh, but at, at the end of the day, I think the American people will make this decision about whether Donald Trump should be reelected and the Democratic nominee should, be, should replace him um, based on a number of things. And that includes whether or not they have the confidence that this country is in careening you know, off the rails and a decision about whether or not they want a president that's going to bring them stability and restore our international reputation and not jeopardize our national security mm -hmm. and invest in, in things like making sure that we have health care that everyone can afford. We have a bill that would lower the cost of prescription drugs sitting in the United States Senate. The president has his own Justice Department 
fighting in court to declare the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional, which would yank health care away from tens of millions of people, Michael. And yeah. we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. 130 million people in this country have a pre-existing condition that would no longer, uh, that would no longer have the protection of having their health care coverage be, uh, be available to them when they need it. We understand. That's uh, what I think American people will make a decision on. Yeah, I, I want to ask you about the Jewish vote uh, in this country and in Florida. I guess there are roughly sure. 700,000 Jews who live in Florida and many of them here in South Florida in your and other nearby congressional districts. Uh, Donald Trump a couple of weeks yes. ago was in Hollywood, Florida speaking to the Israeli American Council and he said to them, essentially, you've got to vote for me because, number one, you want to protect your money and I will protect your money. And then he said, I am the best friend that Israel ever had. So if and I'll, that got big cheers and applause. What would you say to uh, your fellow Jewish voters uh, that why they shouldn't vote for President Trump? I, I actually don't think that I, most Jewish voters uh, share the president's view that he is either Israel's greatest friend um, and, and certainly find disturbing the comments like he made to the Israeli American Council. I, I uh, spoke at that event the next morning. Um, the fact that the president ha continues to spew uh, anti-Semitic tropes over and over, referring to Jews voting for, for him because we care about the, our money, uh, making comments repeatedly that for you know, hundreds, hundreds of years, decades of uh, anti-Semitism in this country that he repeats from the mouth of the pres president of the United States is, uh, is offensive to, to Jewish voters. And at the end of the day, Jewish voters in this country care about making sure that the quality of life here in America uh, is, uh, is of, of the utmost importance, that we protect access to quality, affordable health care, that we make sure that we have religious pluralism and that everyone can get along and support one another. And this president has stoked the, the, the flames of anti-Semitism and bigotry. Uh, his immigration policy is abhorrent. I'm glad that in the appropriations bill that we just sent to the president, we were able to roll back some of his really horrific ability to, uh, to, to harm immigrants simply coming here to try to make a better way of life for themselves and their families. Uh, the Jewish, Jewish voters go to the polls and support a, pre, a, a candidate who believes in making sure that we can address global warming and climate change. I have a sy synagogue in my district, Temple Solel, that has a climate solutions co committee that is very active in making sure that we can raise awareness about global warming, climate change, sea level rise. Right. And, uh, and, and those are the kinds of issues that Jewish voters will go to the polls and make a decision on. And Donald Trump is wrong on all of those issues. Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, great to speak with you. Thanks for taking time out of family time to speak Thank with you. us. Happy holidays. My pleasure, Michael. All right, Thanks. up next, we're going to take all of the week's hot topics to the roundtable. <laughs> Christmas week traditionally is a quiet one, kind of a news-free zone. And for the most part, that was true in South Florida this week. However, the impeachment pot is simmering. The sewer pipes are breaking in Broward. So we've got a lot to talk about with our roundtable, and we've got a great one for you today. Mike Abrams is an old friend, former state representative from Miami, former chair of the Dade Democratic Party, and in some recent op-ed pieces, a critic of the Democratic Party. We are always glad to welcome back our friend Nancy Ancrum, editor of the editorial page of the Miami Herald, and another friend, Ed Pizzoli, president of the Tripp Scott Law Firm in Fort Lauderdale, past chair of the Republican Party of Broward. To all of you, Happy New Year. Thanks for coming in. We Happy appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so Ed, I want all of you to weigh in, but Ed, here we've got this impasse at the moment between Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell. Articles of impeachment still haven't been sent over. Uh, and Nancy uh, Pelosi and the Democrats obviously want a trial rule set, but that's really up to Mitch McConnell. The Constitution provides that the impeachment, the first part of impeachment is under the auspices solely of the House. The second part of the impeachment, the trial piece, is under the Senate. And so whenever these articles come over, let's make sure your viewers understand what the articles are and why there is, 
how would I say, a real question about their validity. The first one is abuse of power and really uh, it's important to know there's no underlying crime like you had in Watergate or even under Bill Clinton when you had him lying mm -hmm. under oath. There's no underlying crime right. like let me, specifically. Let me, let me just jump in right now and say to Nancy Ancrum, but we know from the Federalist Papers and other constitutional lawyers that you don't need, as Ed says, yes, an underlying crime. What you need is something that violates the Constitution and its oath of office. Democrats clearly think that there, there is. I think that they have, and I think that they have a very legitimate point. I also think that uh, too many people probably in this White House think they have a legitimate point, given, that the, fact that, given the fact that no one was allowed to testify from, from mm. the, the Trump this, standpoint. That's the second article you're talking about. Right, exactly. What I would say is that when I'm arrested and I'm going to trial, I really hope like heck that the prosecutors and my attorneys um, um, figure out a way to get me acquitted because that is just what's happening here. Yeah, uh, Mike, in fact, on the first article of impeachment, I think Ed's point really there is validity. Abuse of power is a very kind of vague term to most people and I think if half the electorate at this moment doesn't think Trump should be removed from office, it's because they just don't get abuse of power. Well, I, I, th I think it's clear and I think it's unfortunate probably this whole process does not seem to be moving the electorate particularly in one direction or off where they are. Yeah. But I would also warn that I think there will be a long-term corrosive effect uh, on Trump, on President Trump, uh, months down the road. And if you go... If you, you like November 2020? Yeah, like November. <laughs> and I'll just... Let's, let's go back to the Clinton imp impeachment. We had a great economy like we did now. Clinton's numbers went up. Uh, everything was going well. Clinton wasn't on the ballot, yet the Democrats had every reason to believe they were going to win in 2000, and they lost. Why? Well, and the situation's the same today. Uh, we have a very, an excellent economy. Uh, Trump is on the ballot. He's extremely unpopular. And I think people are going to be exhausted and want to change. Now, I think the corrosive nature of this is, is really set the tone by Nancy Pelosi and Democrats in Congress. This was not supposed to be. The founders actually specifically said they warned us against having a partisan impeachment. In fact, they said maladministration or misadministration of whatever they're doing is not a reason to impeach. Disagreement, partisan disagreement is not a reason to impeach. That takes care of the first article. The second one is even weaker, Michael, because here's the thing. Obstruction of Congress, what the heck is that? What that really is, is that because the, the Congress wanted people from the administration to come and testify and provide documents, they legitimately asserted privileges. Now, what usually happens is that the courts, then the Congress goes to court and has a judge determine the validity of the privileges that are raised. Because if you used a, a president or administration using a privilege not to provide documents or testimony yeah. to Congress, every single president would be impeached yeah. well, at that every, point. No, 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 but hang on. Yeah. The important piece of it is, is that that is such a weak argument because they should have had the courts intervene, but, uh, intervene and force the administration. If they had such a strong hand, they should have had the courts tell the administration yeah. to show up or provide the documents. And and they didn't, and that's the balance between the three three pieces of yeah. government. We don't ha we have a logjam between Congress and the executive branch. The arbiter should have been the courts. The Democrats yeah. rushed to this impeachment, and that's why they have no validity on they, that second they, article. They moved very quickly, Nancy, because yeah. they were afraid if they went to the courts that the the White House and Republicans in Congress would just string this out for months to come. And they would have, and they would have been a legitimate. I mean, that's the way the courts are not known for acting that quickly. Right, absolutely. It would absolutely. have gone on and on and on. Right, and I think Nancy Pelosi at this point is going to have to really justify now her stringing this out. Mm -hmm. I think she can justify it in the short term. Yeah. In the long term, I'm not so well, sure. Her time, her time well, is, her it, time it, is it, running. It, she's really not going to string it out. She knows she's going to have to you know, deliver the documents mm -hmm. of impeachment to the Senate. Uh, what I think the Founding Fathers didn't contemplate was that the United States Senators would violate their oath, How which so? are to be impartial jurors. Oh. You know, we have 
a majority leader of the Senate once again destroying a significant norm of the Senate, saying, I'm not going to be an impartial uh, uh, juror. juror. Yeah. But the, the initial threshold is whether the articles are, in fact, presented to them and whether it's impeachable. Like anything else in court, before you go to trial, there are pretrial motions that knock this out. So the first thing that's going to happen is Chief Justice Roberts is going to preside over the Senate uh, over this impeachment trial. He's going to swear all the hundred senators in. And at that point, the House will likely go ahead and make its presentation mm -hmm. to the Senate. At that point, the president and his team will make a counter presentation. Just so your view is no questions from you won't see questions from the senators directly. You'll see them go through the chief justice. At that point, the chief justice will ask questions of either side. The question is whether or not there are going to be witnesses. That's going to be determined by a majority of the Senate as to the actual procedure. And, and, and finally, very briefly for this segment, uh, if five senators sort of change their minds, the uh, sort of the amplitude, the the kind of questions that can be asked or so could change. I mean, if Lisa Murkowski, Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, and two other senators sort of say, let's change the the rules a little bit up here. If you have majority of the Senate that would allow actually live witnesses in yeah. the Senate well, then the answer is that's what will happen. Now, yeah. I would be careful of either the Democrats or the Republicans overplaying their hand. If you allow witnesses for the House when they yeah. present their articles yeah, of the impeachment, House. you better right. be careful because the yeah. White House is going to present witnesses as well. Right. Well, and just to sort of uh, wrap this up, you know, all these complaints about no due process for the president, I think they're going to be satisfied uh, if the Senate trial is conducted fairly and nobody thinks Justice Roberts won't conduct it fairly, I think. But the House's confidence. procedure, the, the knock on the procedure was most of the evidence, alleged evidence, was gathered in the basement of Congress by Adam Schiff and uh, Republicans weren't even there, Michael. Uh, you, you and I could Fe both agree Fiona, that... Fiona Hill, Colonel Venman, there were people <laughs> yeah. who came forward, you know, who were not allowed by their bosses to do it in the White House and at the State Department, uh, they uh, testified uh, anyway. Uh, I think the weight of the evidence was pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah. A sham, yeah. Right, a sham's yes. a sham, a yeah. sham. <laughs> oh boy. All right, stay with us. Back with more Roundtable in just a minute. <laughs> On this Sunday, the last Roundtable of the year with three great friends and insightful Folks, my friend Ed Pizzoli from Fort Lauderdale, Nancy Ancrum from the Miami Herald, Mike uh, Abrams. Uh, Mike, uh, what we are looking at here is possibly, what, a, a two to three week trial in the Senate, and two of the senators who are going to have to be there for it <laughs> are Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, who want to be in Iowa and New Hampshire. The first vote in the Iowa caucuses is February 3rd, so what does this do to them? Well, their supporters are very committed, as you know. So, uh, l listen, I'm sure they'd rather be in Iowa. I'm sure it's better for them to be in Iowa, but it would be a lot worse for them not to fulfill their constitutional responsibility. Right. So they're stuck. You know, they're just stuck. Uh, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in Iowa uh, because... Yeah. People, you know, it was so far the electorate seems to be someone somewhat locked in, and they're divided amongst four candidates, five candidates. We'll have to yeah. see how well, it but breaks. Nancy, we, we excuse me, yeah. we, we know that in the the latest average of New York Times poll uh, polls, I think that Pete Buttigieg had roughly 25 percent, right. and he yeah. was nine or ten points ahead of Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden, mm -hmm. Elizabeth Warren. Uh, Amy Klobuchar. I mean, and, Mayor and Pete is yeah. is doing very well in Iowa. He's doing very well. Uh, what I have noticed with Iowa is that Iowa often goes its own its its it own does. way. And if Pete wins this, I don't know what it means. I don't think it means a lot for Pete. He still has a lot of convincing to do. Right. He still is seen as the Mm, the liberal but corporate, uh, mm -hmm. uh, corporate. You know, I don't want to say McKinsey lackey, company, but uh, exactly, kind of exactly. Yeah. Which, which is not a bad thing. You know, m my concern is that the Democrats need to stop demonizing billionaires. 
billionaires exist. Billionaires mm -hmm. are writing checks to Democrats. Right. They are not the main problem here. Yeah, well, and I, th I think they've got to find a way to credibly, one, I think that supporters need to stop holding their feet to, their fire, to, yeah. to the fire mm -hmm. over this particular issue. Because yeah. there are just too many important um, issues, whether it's health care, whether it's education, whether it's immigration, that, not are, that are not affected by rich people. Rich right. people exist on both Nancy, sides you, of the aisle. You don't find it ironic that Bloomberg and Tom Steyer are in there spending $200 billion trying to buy the nomination, the Democratic nomination, when you have such a segment, the Bernie Sanders and the, and the Elizabeth Warren supporters and even Pete supporters, who are really, really uh, anti-capitalists, uh, socialists? <laughs> you know, I mean, look, look. You know, in some respects, they, but 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 they're anti-capitalist. They're anti-billionaire. Right. They're they're anti-billionaire while at the same time living the life. But you don't you see know? that. You don't see that irony, irony in that. And well, of course, there's irony. They're going to have to duke it out, and de Democrats are really going to have to decide who they're going to be well, they for have, this exactly. particular high-stakes mm. election. Right. As and, a matter of fact, excuse me, ahead. Mike Abrams has written a couple of op-eds over the last year or so in which you have said, the, as I characterize it correctly, you have said that the Democratic Party can't go to a liberal progressive extreme, that it, if it's going to win in 2020, mm -hmm. it has to move to the middle, roughly the middle, if I said that correctly? Is that where you stand? Uh, well, look, not quite. I think ult ultimately uh, what the Democrats have to do is nominate a good candidate. Okay, we're in, our, our politics are very candidate driven. And so the quality of the candidate matters above all. But let me say this about where the Democratic Party is. I think the center is holding in the Democratic okay. Party. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of growth in the Sanders uh, Warren wing of the party. Yeah, well, Joe and Biden think, remains. Joe yeah, Biden nationwide yeah, is far and away he's, the favorite. He's very candidate. stable, and I think you know Budacek is is in the middle there, and mm -hmm. so is Klobuchar. Mm -hmm. And when I think this sorts out, and when you talk to Democrats, they're going to be making a very pragmatic decision right. at the end. Who could beat Donald Trump? And it was a great, uh, thanks, for, thanks for the admission. If Pete Buttigieg is the middle of the Democratic Party, then the middle, the definition of middle has significantly changed. And so well, it's Bernie moved pushed to, the it to the left. Yes, he has. Right. He's pushed it to the left. And I wouldn't sleep on him because his supporters are pretty rabid on him. And I do see a split coming out of these first four uh, caucus primary right. states. And there's not a lot of delegates anyway. But in the end, Super Tuesday, and that's where Bloomberg plays. And the real right. question is, does he get any traction? Because his traction is looking at it objectively as just a political uh, analysis. Is he going to take away from Biden? And in, in the end, mm -hmm. that's going to be the key. How much traction does somebody like Michael Bloomberg get by spending a ton of money in Super Tuesday? And ultimately, are Democrats really going to go for somebody like a Pete Buttigieg? Let's face it. His background is not unimpressive, but politically speaking, yeah. he's simply the right. mayor of South Bend, well, Indiana. What, exactly. And that's what Amy that's Klobuchar it. pointed out in the last Democratic debate right. was, you know, your credentials are thin, sir. Yeah. Right. And, and he, he moved, tried to talk back, but right. in fact, they are, they right. are right. thin. Right. All right. We're going to take a brief break. Uh, be back with more Roundtable in just a minute. Well, yeah. We are in the midst, I think, of a really rockin' round table here, the last one of the year. Before we get off presidential politics, I do want to ask you all briefly, uh, Michael Bloomberg, obviously, mayor of New York, has been a Republican, a Democrat, a moderate politically on so many issues. Uh, he is Jewish. And I think a kind of underlying question is, is America ready to elect a Jew to be president? I think we all asked this in 1960. I'm certainly old enough to remember JFK, you know, could America elect a Catholic? And the answer was yes, they could. What do you, what do you think, Ed? On, put aside, separate Bloomberg from his religion for a second. If you ask the precise question, is America able to, uh, willing and able to vote for a Jewish 
nominee? The answer is, I believe yes. Mm -hmm. Do I think Michael Bloomberg as a candidate has issues? Yes, he has issues that may prevent him. It won't be the fact that he's Jewish. The issue for Democrats, though, is that he is spending a lot of money in Super Tuesday states when you have a the, the map spreads out and you have to spend a lot of money. You have Texas and California as the yeah. big prizes. And there's only, there's only, the only way to get communication is by spending a lot of money in those states. Yeah. And will he ultimately take from what would be the moderate vote that would probably otherwise go to Joe Biden? That's the question. Why is that a problem? I mean, You're in, I, you I may end up with a brokered it, convention. Not a problem for it, me. You no, know but I think if Bloomberg won the nomination, for instance, because he gathered steam I'm okay on with Super that. Tuesday, I think he'd be a formidable candidate. Um, I, I, yeah. I don't disagree with I you. I think he'd yeah. be formidable, formidable, too. I think he would be able to draw. Um, queasy moderate Republicans to his side. <laughs> That's moderate. a good, good way to put it. <laughs> you know, but to the question, uh, is America ready for yeah. a Jewish president? I think we have to say yes. yes. I mean, yeah. we, we elected an African American. Um, yeah. Is America ready for a gay president? Is Mer uh, America uh, ready for uh, a woman, for good goodness go. sake? Yeah. And it's a shame that we have to ask these questions yes. in the 21st century. Yeah, it is. I don't think there's a question. I, I think a yeah. woman can can be nominated yeah. and win mm -hmm. and a, a, a Jewish someone who's Jewish can be nominated mm -hmm. and win yeah. it, it really depends on but the part. Can, it, it depends it, on the person depends on the candidate but Absolutely. can a Jewish gay woman win with, with one arm? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, come on. All right, we're, we're in the weeds here. Yeah, right, we're before, we, before we run out of time, the state, the, the Florida legislature, God bless them, are about to convene uh, in a couple of weeks. And uh, Mike Abrams, you've spent a lot of time. You were in the Florida legislature. What are the big issues? What, what are they really going to be grappling with this time? Well, I think the biggest issue is the governor has put, on, put at the top of the agenda a very aggressive uh, teacher pay raise. Right. And um, he's rallying support for it, but the problem and the question is gonna be is how do we distribute that raise? Right. You know, do we give it to new teachers? Do we spread it? You can't spread it across the board because it's not enough money. Yeah. So there's gonna be, a, a, I think, a fairly intense debate about how the new money is spent, but it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I, uh, I did. I thought the Miami Herald has an excellent article today it, on this very subject mm -hmm. about how you do it. It cites a teacher who's been in the system for five years who is making less than forty-seven five a year, which right. is what the governor is proposing to hire new teachers at forty-seven five. So equity is a big issue right. here. How do you how do you do it fairly? It's a big issue, but you know, Ron DeSantis is uh, running about 65 to 70 percent approval, and I think he's going to get something out of this legislature that impacts teachers' compensation. And I do think it's it, let's. I don't know if you can solve all the ills that everybody wants to try to solve with teacher comp, but you can set a floor up. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's 47.5, that's the minimum salary for a teacher in Florida. That's a heck of a start, Michael. Yeah, it would, well, it would we, be good. Yeah, but the problem is for those teachers that have been there 10, 15 years and are only making slightly above that, and they're going to be saying, Are, are you looking at gift, a gift horse on the mouth, but, Michael? I mean, I mean no, come on. No, no, no. I'm just saying it's a challenge. That's it's a, a challenge. Whole, it's, it's a, a challenge political challenge. With a ripple That's effect. All. And um, we expl uh, uh, expressed our. Mm -hmm pleasure that um, the, the governor wanted full funding, let's mm -hmm. say, for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Right. Uh, why Instead I, of siphoning money exactly. off the way they usually do. Exactly. 47.5 does not buy you a lot. That's why I say there is a ripple effect to this raise and to the fairness with how it's going to be distributed. Yeah. To It's going to affect everything in terms of quality yeah. of life. That is going to be the final word, and a good one it is. Thank you all for coming in. Happy New Year. Happy Great New Year. to have you here. Happy New Year. Here is a live look now from our tower camps across South Florida. And here is weather authority meteorologist Brandon Orr with your Sunday forecast. Hey, Brandon. Hey, Michael. Yeah, we are stretching, but we are finding some sun out there and they're finding it at the Broad Rock. Look at all the people who've come out to the beach to try and get some beach day out of this.
Uh, 80 degrees is where we're headed. We're pretty close to it. That wind is coming in from the southeast, though, 10 to 15. So there is a high risk for rip currents. Just be aware if you're going down to the beaches. We had some water rescues recently, and it looks like we could have some more again today, uh, unless you're careful out there in the water. Now, we do have some rain, and it's mainly focused in a band that's coming in across the upper keys and then eventually out over the Everglades, which is better news in Miami up to Fort Lauderdale. And on the other side of that band, over in Key West, so right now we're mostly dry. A couple of sprinkles headed into Miami Beach and downtown right now, but we're going to have that on and off in times today, but certainly not a washout of a day expected. We're going to be into the lower 80s. I think much of that rain on New Year's will clear out with a cold front by midnight, which is the good news if you have any New Year's Eve plans and certainly New Year's Day itself. Michael, I don't know if it gets any better than that. 77 degrees, low chance of rain. Sounds good to me. It sounds good to me too, Brandon. Thanks. All right, before we leave you today, a personal perspective about the year 2019. It is almost over and not a moment too soon. It was, as always, the best of times and the worst of times. The worst, I think, was having our lives dominated by one person who, by dent of personality and shameless self-promotion, used up all the oxygen in the room, or most of the oxygen. Boo on the media for letting that happen. And now, to his credit, the president amped up the economy. The stock market is going gangbusters, ending the year at record highs. And we're pretty much at peace in an increasingly dangerous world. At the same time, our standing in the world has been diminished. The United States once was the leader of the free world. We made it safe for democracy. We were the shining city on the hill. We supported fledgling democracies. We set the moral standard that other countries aspired to. Sadly, that's all in the past now. You can't set a high moral standard when you are snatching babies from their parents' arms at the border or when you are abandoning allies like the Kurds to placate an autocrat in Turkey. Hard to set a high moral standard for anyone else when your president is, as Christianity Today put it, grossly immoral. Despite all that, the center is holding. Mere anarchy is not loosed upon the world. We will get through this bleak period in American history. And as we do, I think we have to look to our local leaders, local communities for common sense decisions and decency. The government closest to the people is the one that matters most. And in our personal lives, we continue to look to our partners, wives and husbands, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters for love and support, grace and comfort. I also find it important to be part of a faith community that helps remind me, helps remind us there is something larger than ourselves, that life is not just brownie in motion. And so we beat on boats against the current, born back ceaselessly into the past, as F. Scott Fitzgerald said in The Great Gatsby, the great American novel. Jay Gatsby strove to reach the green light at the end of the dock across the bay. He never reached it. In 2020, we will all strive to reach our own green light, the one we see out on the horizon. We may or may not reach it, but it's the journey that counts. So together, let's make it a better one in 2020. Happy New Year. That's my perspective. Hope you have a wonderful Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. And you can catch any of our local shows on local10.com. You can also subscribe online to our This Week in South Florida podcast. Stay tuned now for SoFlo Health. That is right here next. We'll see you next Sunday and happy 2020.